Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to my very first online art lesson. Um, I'm very excited to start uh, being able to offer these sorts of online classes just because of the accessibility and the convenience and the affordability for everyone. Um, I'll have lots more information about uh, how the classes are going to work and how you can sign up and pricing and all of that great stuff at the end of this video, but to start out, I just want to do a free lesson for all of you just to give you an idea of what the lessons will be like and what you can expect from them. So um, we'll get to all the other stuff at the end of this video and even if you don't sign up, I hope that you just enjoy getting into some creative painting and maybe learning something you didn't know before. So to start out, let's just uh, dive straight into what we're going to be doing tonight. We are going to be painting a still life, which is a great way to um, learn more about painting and to learn some new techniques, but it's also a pretty thing to hang on your wall whenever you're done or to give as a gift. Um, so let's take a look at the materials that we're going to be using for this project. I'll also post a list of these materials wherever the video is posted in the description or um, somewhere where it's written out so you can see it. So let's look at the materials. All right, so for materials, we are going to be using acrylic paint. You can use any kind of acrylic paint if you already have some lying around your house, but if you don't, the kind of paint that I like to use is just this cheap um, craft paint that is not typically marketed to be used for um, painting on canvas or for fine art or things like that. I love it just because it is very cheap. Most of the times these are less than a dollar or a little bit over a dollar. Um, I like them because they come in a wide variety of colors and while I'm sure we'll do some lessons on color mixing, when I get time to work in my studio, I don't like to spend a lot of time mixing colors. I like to have a nice selection of all the things that I need ready to go. And that way I can just make the most use of my time. And as I said, these are very affordable. So there are a few different brands that you can get. Um, they're typically what you'll see, and they sell these at Walmart, at craft stores. Um, there's Anita's, which is a good one. Um, there's Apple Barrel. This tends to be a lot thinner than some of the other ones. Um, my favorite would be Folk Art, which I don't have any colors in that brand, but I have um, a couple of other things in the Folk Art brand. And uh, one thing that you want to look out for, this is an enamel paint. Um, so it's actually made for going on glass. Um, you can use this for canvas painting and it's just going to be a lot glossier. You do want to be careful sometimes to avoid things like chalk finishes or any kind of special finish like that. Um, this was something I actually just got by mistake, and it's the black that I have on hand for tonight. So, you know, again, whatever you have lying around your house, just give it a try and see if you can make it work. But so for our still life, these are the colors we're going to need. We're going to need orange, gray, gold or yellow, burnt umber, green, black, red, white and then this here is a floating medium and it is pretty cheap about the same price as these other paints here and this is just something that we're going to mix into some of our colors towards the end of our project that's going to make the paint really thin and we'll go into more about what we're going to use that for. Um, as for brushes, um, I've just grabbed some sort of small to medium brushes um, and then I've got one sort of bigger brush that we're going to use for the background. Um, I Here in the back here you can see I keep a pretty wide variety of brushes on hand from um, bigger foam brushes and I've got my big 
giant one for doing backgrounds and bigger canvases. And then I've also got really, really tiny detail brushes. We don't want either of those for this. We want stuff that's still pretty small, but, um, you know, sort of in the medium range. Again, for brushes, I don't use anything super fancy. The brush packages that you can get at Walmart or craft stores work just fine, um, especially when you're just starting out and learning. Some other things to have on hand are a cup of water that will get messy, so make sure it's something old that you don't really care about keeping too clean. Um, a paint rag. Uh, you can keep some baby wipes on hand if you're painting with little ones or if you're very worried about mess. Um, a paint palette. What I use for my paint palettes a lot of times is I just take a plastic plate um, and wrap it in plastic wrap or aluminum foil. And that way, whenever I'm done, all I have to do is just take this off and toss it in the trash and I'm done. Um, you can just use the plate itself and wash it off at the end of each use. Um, so that's another way you can go with that. Um, uh, one thing that I wanna point out, cause I mentioned the baby wipes and if you were painting with little ones, tonight's lesson is going to be geared towards adults. I will be posting another version of this lesson, which will also be a free video that you'll have access to that's going to be um, the same lesson but for children. Um, so this particular lesson, younger children can do it depending on the artistic ability that they already have and their patience and things like that, but mostly I would recommend it for teens and adults. Okay, so uh, another thing that we will need for this is going to be the picture of our still life. So I found the picture of my still life um, just on a, this is just like a free stock image. If you get into Google and you search for free stock images, a lot of times you'll come up with these high res quality images that are out there for people to use. Sometimes they do have stipulations, like if you were going to paint this and then try to sell it, this might be restricted in a way that wouldn't allow you to make profit off of its use or for commercial uses in any way. So you want to be careful of things like that. But if it's just for practicing and it's just for um, learning or something that you're going to hang in your house or give as a gift, usually the free stock images work great. So... Um, Another thing that I'll speak on for that really quickly is that, uh, you know, a lot of people will say it's best to paint from life as opposed to painting from photos. Um, I prefer to paint from photos just because, kind of like what I was saying with mixing the colors, when I have time to sit down and paint, I don't have a lot of time. It's usually my kids are in bed, I've got a couple hours before I have to go to bed, so I'm very limited on time. And uh, I just like having a photo for the convenience of it, and I can just put it up right here next to my easel. I don't have to worry about setting up the light a certain way and getting it done by a certain time before the light changes, or you know, I don't have to worry about my kids coming in and messing up the setup that I have. Um, if you don't have kids in your life, you may not have to worry about those things, but just for my preferences, I like to work from a photo, but you could just as easily do the exact same lesson we're going to do here tonight with a live setup of still life, which in this case is just a bowl of fruit. So let's get started. Um, one more material that you'll need will be something to paint on. So I have just a stack of canvases that are actually um, just old canvases that I had lying around my studio that were paintings I didn't like or that I never finished and I've just whitewashed over them. So that's why you'll see kind of this inconsistent background. We're not going to see any of that by the end of the piece so you don't have to worry about that. Um, again, it's just all about using what you have around your house or what's easy, easy to get and affordable. I would say with the paint and brushes and all the things I've talked about so far, even cheap canvas included, if you do have to buy it new, you're looking at $20 to $30 tops. And a lot of these things, like your brushes and your paints, you're going to use over again. 
And when you're just starting out and learning, if you don't want to keep a painting that you've done for a lesson, you can paint over it and use it again, just as I've done here, which is good when you're learning. Um, in the beginning, you might do something that you think looks really good at the time, and then maybe later on your skills get better and you think you could do a better job on a different painting, so maybe you want to reuse that canvas. So anyway, uh, I'm just going to take my still life picture here, hang it somewhere nice and close to my easel where I can see it. Uh, let's see here. There you go. So it's nice and lined up and uh, I can easily reach all of my materials here, turn to my canvas, look at my photo, everything's within reaching distance. All right, so time to start painting. The very first thing that we are going to do is we are going to um, start with the background of our image. And what I'm talking about right now is not actually going to be the finished background of our painting. Every, most everything that we do in these first few steps will actually be completely covered up by the end of our painting, which will make sense as we go along. Um, but the first thing we want to do is we just want to do a quick wash over this background, and it is actually going to lay the middle ground for our painting, so it's sort of the parts of our painting that are not shadows or highlights. It's the middle tone for what we're working with. So you can grab your paint palette and what you'll want first is the um, burnt umber and you don't need a whole lot of it, just a good little dab. And I had mentioned um, having a bigger brush on hand um, that's what we're going to use to do this background just because it's easiest. I'm going to get lots of water on my brush and really water down this paint. You can see I'm just barely getting the edge of it. This is just going to be a thin wash. We don't want it to be a dark brown. And as you start painting, don't worry about what it looks like. Right now, just get it all covered up as quickly as possible. We don't want to spend a lot of time on this. So some parts may be lighter. You may get some drips here and there. Don't worry about any of that. I'm going to go back for some more water just to keep this nice and thin. Make sure you can see what I'm doing here. So this part of the painting that we're working on now is called our underpainting. And the purpose of our underpainting is to establish the light and the shadows of our painting. But we're actually going to do most of the work of our painting in this underpainting, depending on how realistic you want to make your piece. And some of the stuff I'm saying again will make more sense once you get used to this process and as we get further along in the painting. So I just realized um, for our still life I'm actually going to want to landscape this and have my canvas facing this way. Um, now that we've done our wash we do actually want to let this dry. Um, you can use a hair dryer if you have one on hand or just go take a break before you get into the rest of your painting. Um, but you want this to be pretty dry before you get started. So we'll be back in a minute whenever it's nice and dry. All right, so we have a nice dry canvas here. And you can see how this background, just as I was saying, is pretty light. Um, just knocks out the white that we're working with and gives us a nice base for our painting. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is get the shapes from our still life onto our canvas so that we can start adding in our shadows and our highlights. Um, one of the biggest things that I think intimidates people about art is they look at an image like this still life like this bowl of fruit, and it feels very complicated and overwhelming. But the longer that you practice drawing and painting, the more that you're going to start to see that 
everything's just made up of shapes, right? We have our oranges and our apples are just circles. They're just funny shaped circles. And we have our bananas, which is just a shape like this. And we have our bowl, which is almost just like a half circle. So um, one thing that I want you to start thinking about early on is to not feel overwhelmed by an image, but to instead sort of stop and break it down into the shapes that it's in. Um, and especially for a lesson like this, if you haven't done much painting before, you don't even have to worry about making the proportions and the sizes just like your picture or just like your bowl of fruit. Um, this is more about learning the technique of painting. And so you can have a stylized bowl of fruit. It doesn't have to be super realistic and perfectly shaped. So in order to get our image onto our canvas, you can use a pencil or a marker even. One thing with markers is that sometimes the lines do show through, especially when you're working with these thin craft paints, which sometimes can be a fun effect to play around with. Um, but you can also just paint it on. And since I already have some of this burnt umber on my paint palette, that's what I'm going to do. I'm just gonna grab the smallest brush that I have to work with. I'm gonna stay away from the uh, super watered down parts of my paint left over from the background and work more with the um, thick, regular consistency paint that I have on my palette. Um, okay, so let's start with this bowl that we have. And to get myself started, I'm gonna look at a couple of things. I'm gonna look at the distance between the bottom of the bowl and the bottom of the page of my picture. And I'm just gonna roughly do a little line that I think closely represents that. So I'm looking at the distance between the bottom of the bowl and the bottom of the picture. And then I'm gonna work my way up. I know that as we get to the top of this bowl, this edge is gonna be closer to the edge of the canvas than this bottom part is. We have a little dip here, and then it goes up for a bit, and we have another little dip in the lip of the bowl. So I'm just gonna look at the shape of that line. I'm just gonna kind of try to replicate it. And again, it doesn't have to be super perfect. And your lines can be lighter than this also. I'm just making mine a little bit dark so that you can see them. Now everyone has different styles of painting and drawing. Mine's pretty loose, so you'll notice that I do lots of quick, short brush strokes. If you're a super precise person, that may not be your style, and you may want to very carefully go in here and get one long brush stroke. There's no right or wrong way to do that, that's fine. And so I've got the bottom shape of my bowl and I don't want you to spend a lot of time on this. Again, I want you to just sort of get the basic idea of it up there. But that being said, you could also take a lot of time with this if you wanted it to be super precise and exact. So I have the shape of my bowl. I'm not gonna worry about these stripes just yet. Um, let's move on into the fruit. I'm gonna start with these little oranges right here. Um, so you'll notice this orange isn't quite sitting on the very edge of the bowl. It's over a couple of inches. So I'm just going to try to replicate that. And noticing that my orange is a circular shape, but it's not a perfect circle, right? It's got some inconsistencies in the shape of it. So I'm going to try to make that happen on my canvas. And now I'm going to move into this small little orange up here, which is a little bit more symmetrical. It's like a good little oval. All right, so underneath that, I can see that we have this apple here that this orange is resting on. And that's just like a little half circle. So that's easy. All right, now let's do this big apple that's sitting in the foreground here. Always try to work with whatever's sitting closest to you in the foreground and work your way to the back of your image. So I'm gonna work on this big apple here and you can see that, or I'm seeing, 
that there's actually a lot more room on the side of the bowl in the picture than what I've got left in my image. That's okay. This apple can sit in front of this apple here in my painting. So it doesn't have to be super exact. Okay. All right, so now I've got another little apple that's sort of peeking out on the side here. It's not gonna be quite as big in my painting as it is in the picture, and that's okay. Let's jump back, actually, let's go right here. There's one more little apple peeking out between these two. You can see it just right there. So I'm just gonna do one little line, and that shows us there's something else in the background there. All right, so let's move on to these bananas. Uh, we've got the stem of some bananas poking up on the side here. So I'm just gonna do a rough outline of that. Basically just like a rectangle goes down into this little curved shape. And the lip of our bowl is gonna, we see the back side of that bowl wrapping around there. So I'm just gonna do a quick little line for that. All right, so now we've got, again, another sort of rectangular shape here, which is the other stems of our bananas. And this first banana we're working on here, we can't quite see all of it. We just sort of see pieces of it poking out from behind these apples. And then one big banana right here on top. And then we've got some curvature in the inside of that banana that I'm gonna add there. So even though I know that this is not exactly like the photo, I know that I'm not incredibly far off because I've got about the same distance between the top of my canvas as there is from this banana and the top of the paper over here. So if you want to, now you can go in and start adding a little bit of definition in this background, which in this picture is pretty blurry and I wanna keep it that way. So I'm gonna look at this table. How much distance do I have between this line of the table and the bowl? the top of the bowl that's up here. And I'm just gonna try to make a line that's about that same distance on my canvas and continue it over to the other side. All right, and I might do a few little quick lines in the background here just to show some definition of what could be windows or walls or whatever's happening in the background there. Okay, so we have some very basic shapes and lines. <clears throat> now what we're gonna do is we're gonna start adding in shadows. Now, most people will say that when you are working on an underpainting that you shouldn't use black. Um, the more traditional way of doing this, I guess, from here would to just be to use your burnt umber to start adding in shadows to these shapes. Um, I have a pretty bold style of painting uh, with lots of high contrast, so I like using black, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to switch to just a slightly bigger brush now, and I've got a little bit of black on my plate. I'm going to add just a tiny bit of water to it. And just like we did with the wash, I'm gonna come just to the edge of my paint and kind of brush them out. Now what I'm gonna do is, we're not looking at color right now. We're looking at our shadows and our highlights. So I'm gonna identify all of the darkest places of this picture, which is mostly going to be happening in these little cracks and crevices in between the fruit. So this does not necessarily apply to these parts of the banana stems that are really dark because that's not a shadow. That's the color of our banana. So it can be hard to get used to, but we're going to try to ignore those places right now and instead focus on shadow, not color. So I'm just looking for 
all of the darkest shadows. These will not be our only shadows. We are going to come back in with the burnt umber and add shadows that are in there but maybe aren't quite as dark and dramatic. So don't feel like you have to be overzealous with this and get every single shadow in black. I'm just going to try to get the darkest ones. And maybe we've got some more really dark shadows back here in between our bananas. And again, just always looking at the space and the distance in between things. You can use that for your shadows too. I can look at um, the shape of the shadow on the apple and kind of estimate how big it needs to be. All right, so you shouldn't really have a whole lot of super dark shadows for a picture like this. And we'll come back and do these stripes later because again, these are gonna be color and not necessarily shadows. Okay, so I think that I'm good for my black. I'm gonna rinse my brush just a tad, but it doesn't have to be perfect because I don't care if I still have some of that black left on my brush. I'm going to come back in and I'm going to now get those shadows that we talked about that are there. They're just not as light or, excuse me, as dark as the black would be. So now I'm looking for any shadows that are kind of dark but not extreme. Add some more darkness to this little apple here. I hope that everyone's going to enjoy these lessons because I can already tell that I'm going to enjoy doing them a lot. I'm feeling like I'm really channeling my Bob Ross right now. Okay. So I might come in with this burnt umber and now I might start looking at some more places on my table and in the background. So around this bowl there are a couple of shadows. There's just a slight one over here off to the side, a kind of bigger one over here. And that shadow is a little bit darker than what I want it to be, but you know what, as we start adding color to this we can fix that. There's not a whole lot you can do in a painting that can't be fixed in some way. I have outlined some things in Sharpie before and had it show through layer after layer of paint and you know kind of regretted that but I want to say even then I found a solution for it so you know it's really nothing to be afraid of because you can fix just about anything. All right, and maybe I want to add a little bit of... I'm actually going to switch to my big background brush that we used in the beginning just to get a little bit in this corner. I've got lots of drippies and I'm not worried about it because for one, if it does end up showing through, I think it adds a little bit of character to the painting but most likely we're going to end up painting over it and it's not going to matter. And I can even come in and kind of blend out that shadow that I was worried about being too dark. I am going to come in on the bowl a little bit now. We've got a little light shadow happening in the front. Maybe get some under that top lip there. Okay, so this is pretty good for the start of that. Now, we don't have to do a sort of um, middle ground of shadows because that's what we've already done in our background. So basically what we have now are three different tones happening in our painting. We have the darkest shade, um, something that's slightly lighter than that. 
We have our middle tone. Now we can start working on highlights. Um, now highlights are a lot of fun to add in. Um, actually, I grabbed my white. I don't want my white. What I like to do for this is sometimes get something more like a yellow. And I might actually use a little bit of white. What I'm thinking of here is we're gonna do highlights, but we don't necessarily need like these super bright white pops yet because once we've added our color, we can go back and add those highlights on top. So I'm just gonna do a little bit of white and a little bit of yellow. Uh, I can go back to my sort of medium brush I was using before. I'm gonna mix those together just to get a, a light yellow. And my thinking with this is if we're not thinking about color and we're thinking about just highlights and shadows, as I've been saying, yellow is actually a very nice alternative to white. It's a little bit more subtle that we can use to add in some of these highlights. So it's gonna be sort of a brighter pop than this um, background shade is but not quite as dramatic as white. So I'm gonna forget that this is a yellow color and think of it as more of a shade of white. And wherever I see a highlight, I'm just gonna go ahead and add that. This is a little bit unconventional, or at least it looks that way with the particular color scheme I have going on here. Um, but we'll experiment, and I think once we start putting the color glazes on, it's going to look great. So I've got some highlights along the top of my bowl. And maybe a little bit on my table over here. Now when you are working on these bananas, be careful not to get confused and think about the color of the banana. Again, just think of where the highlights are. Add some nice highlights to my apples. Maybe there's some more highlights happening on the edge of my oranges in certain places where the light is hitting it. And we can come into our background. Again, I'm gonna switch over to that big brush. Just to sort of cover some more ground. So highlights, highlights, highlights is what we're thinking with this yellow. Okay. <clears throat> so this is another place where your canvas needs to be pretty dry because the next step is we're gonna start adding some color to this. So um, this is a good chance to take a break, to step back from your painting and see how it's looking. Um, or if you're really impatient, you can grab a hair dryer and take it to this.